Thoughts by callers. This is Tom McCullough. Uh, I'm the uh, chairperson of the, of the Planning and Architecture SIG for the Industry Advisory Council, uh, actually the American Council for Technology slash Industry Advisory Council. Is there anyone else on the line out there? Okay. Uh, well, again, I'm Tom McCullough, the chair. Um, I'd like everybody to introduce themselves uh, right now before we start. John? So, uh, welcome, everyone. We've got the, the webinar up and running. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining. Uh, my name is John Shaw. I'm the ACT IAC uh, Director for the Shared Interest Groups. Pamela Weiss Martinez with PMISE, uh, Senior Strategic Enterprise Architect. Ross Corbett, PMISE, uh, I'm with Stakeholder Engagement. I am Herschel Chandler with the Information on the Mid. Okay, thank and, you. Um, and Mike Dunham. Oh, yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, Mike is a former chair uh, of the SIG, uh, for those of you, those of you uh, who may be here for the first time. Um, uh, planning and Architecture SIG, first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody. This is our, this is our second monthly meeting of okay, uh, the new program here, which began in July of last year. I've been a member of the SIG uh, since its beginning, as Mike in the test is certainly. Um, and our, in, our, in our monthly membership meetings, we'd like to bring in speakers such as Pamela to talk about uh, the the issues of the day, especially those that um, relate to uh, relate to some of the initiatives that are that are SIG is sponsoring. Uh, for example, we have the we, we published a series of papers called Smart Thing Government, focused around three topics: communities of service, a service integration model, and life events. And most recently, we're just about ready to get a paper on life events out the door, which it talks about life events down to a lower level of decomposition than what we had in the three in the three pages that are out there. And the service integration model is uh, arguably one of the more one of the more complicated aspects of the three pillars because it, it covers it really deals with service oriented architecture and uh, service catalog and patterns of business uh, end to end process flow patterns if you will and uh, some, some topics such as that we have an outline uh, available for that for review that's on the website certainly in draft form right now and um, I'm not going to say too much more but uh, uh, I want to introduce Pamela for sure and <clears throat> mention that uh, our next SIG meeting will be uh, September since we have a monthly meeting. We always meet the uh, second Wednesday of the month. And uh, Pamela right now is a, is, a, is a nominee to serve in our government advisory panel. But let me let me talk a little bit about, about Pamela first just as, as a way of introducing her. Pamela, thank you very much for volunteering to come. I'm, I'm really, really glad that you had that like to welcome you for sure. As she said, she's a senior strategic enterprise architect uh, for the Program Manager Information Sharing Environment, Office of the Director of Intelligence, and she's responsible for articulating and delivering the information sharing environments in, in, interoperability framework integrated landscape, I, or I2FIL, that's the, the acronym for it. And that represents uh, it's a, a holistic approach using cross-linking business and technical management disciplines in architecture profiles and industry standards and specifications uh, there should be in specifications for the engineering disciplines. And uh, if this is correct, uh, apparently you just recently accepted, uh, accepted a post for the Information and Interoperability Services Government Domain Task Force Chair. Is that correct? That's correct. The Office Which is an international standards development organization. I'm, I'm certainly familiar with that. I'm anxious to hear what Pamela has to say because I've heard, uh, I think, two presentations that Pamela's given. They've been very intriguing last year. So, Pamela, I'd like to turn it over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here, and um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, so I've done uh, a couple of uh, presentations with ACT I Act. I recently just did a presentation at uh, MIT and another one, uh, another one with uh, another organization uh, that was sort of similar. And then earlier this year, I did uh, a briefing with NIST on cloud and mobile technology. So um, one of the areas we focused on was interoperability and how you move to cloud, how you move, uh, develop uh, mobile services. And one of the things that kept you know, really pounding out and to me was this ideal around interoperability. And, and it wasn't... Uh, 
um, just because the that was the you know soup du jour. That wasn't the you know the top of the day. It was really fundamental in uh, really delivering services. So today my talk is really about those exchange patterns, but I've sort of woven in here some of those discussion topics about the cloud, and so you 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 will hear some of that as well, and the challenges with enterprise data because going to the cloud that's really what you're trying to achieve. Next slide, please. So the future knock, and uh, one of the things my colleagues and I have talked about over and over at uh, PMIC as well as act I act is, you know, the, the concept of BYOC, and it's not just bring your own device anymore, no longer. It is truly bring your own cloud. And uh, the, the idea behind that is everything as a service. I mean, you, you're hearing those, you know, the, I guess the buzzwords in the industry around every, uh, you know, uh, Internet of Things, industrial Internet. Well, they truly are buzzwords. This is where the future is going, and we see that more and more. Uh, so, so the idea around five tiers of government will benefit the most from this this, this hybrid uh, hybrid cloud strategies and, and through the ideal of service integration. Everything as a service crossing boundaries and domains of home, work, and government. Next slide, please. Uh, so I did some research about two years ago, I started the research about uh, maybe a year and a half ago uh, regarding, you know, what the leaders were saying about cloud mo mobility and, and those kind of things, you know, sort of uh, parsing out the, 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 the buzz of it all, but really getting down to what government agencies are trying to achieve and what's really important from a, a, a citizen-centric perspective. And so one of the things you'll see here in this slide that actually came from uh, Giga OM Research, uh, a world-renowned research organization um, that, that has done some uh, really uh, interesting, uh, pulled out some really interesting statistics around cloud. And one of the top things around cloud and this idea was that there are uh, drivers, there are inhibitors, and there's things that are happening today, and then there's things that we should be worried about in the future. Well, the, the, if you look at this slide, things that inhibit us really haven't changed. We're so aware of the, the concern about privacy, security, cost. Uh, you know, those things, uh, and then drivers being scalability, agility, uh, total cost of ownership. But what's more important here, I think uh, the inhibitor of the future is really interoperability. And uh, it is one of the most leading inhibitors. And uh, obviously complexity and those things play a role there, but but interoperability in building services that make sense uh, from a agnostic standpoint so that you can reuse them over and over is really where uh, the future is and where the market is going. Uh, so here, uh, this is what this slide is really capturing. Next slide, please. So uh, the next uh, thought here was really uh, the idea behind the cost of, of not being interoperable because uh, the, the facts remain that the government has a very difficult time as well as everyone else, not just the uh, public uh, side or public sector, uh, you know, we, we're looking at dollars, we have to deal with sequestration, we're dealing with all these things, but yet we have the mission needs that we have to address and mission requirements. Well, there is a cost of not building things smartly or not building things in a more modular and more uh, intrinsically interoperable way. And, um, the way we see this is, you know, the, the, the cost of not doing it is really that continuous rebuild. I think we see that over and over. We've seen it for the last 15, 20 years. Uh, lack of understanding of the impact, so there's really no clarity around the enterprise architecture of it all. And then there's escalated IT burden, IT burden. so operationally, you're, you're consistently having to uh, uh, resource and, and, and continually uh, manage and service and support mission systems that aren't interoperable. Uh, shared services, the question mark there is really is that you can't get to shared service, quite frankly, if you're not interoperable, if you're not building in a more modular way. So in my um, 
uh, and this is Pamela Wise speaking, that I, I believe, you know, there's a huge educational need. There's a gap there in, in, in the federal government in terms of service and service uh, architecture and what that really means. Uh, and again, uh, parsing out the technology and really looking at the disciplines around service oriented architecture. Uh, they also, uh, the concentration of resources on core and mission competencies, and I'll talk a little bit about that but uh, later on, but the ideal here is, you know, if you are, if your bailiwick is, you know, mission system, uh, uh, servicing, uh, border patrol, or healthcare, and those kinds of things. Why are you focused on HR as much? HR systems. Why are you? Uh, you know, that should really be outsourced, and that should really. That's where cloud and all these other technologies really can play a role to help you reduce cost. Next slide, please. Uh, this is ground zero for me um, in an NSA service model. I uh, designed this uh, service. Uh, uh, architecture, if you will, prescriptive architecture for the uh, NNSA, so that's the uh, National Nuclear Security Administration, and it is a uh, subcomponent or quasi sub agency of DOE, Department of Energy. And when we started off on our quest to look at uh, the ideal of virtualization, mobility, and cloud, we started looking, we, you know, we followed the guidelines that most people would. We, we looked at NIST, you know, we, we, you know, we talked to Gardner, we looked at all the research papers, everyone out there that was really, and this was back in the, uh, 2010, uh, so we started that quest then to kind of look at. Now, uh, as you know, the Department of Energy, uh, frankly, uh, has a huge uh, uh, cadre of, of, of scientists, researchers, computer scientists, people that are really smart about, you know, everything from virtualization to grid. So we weren't reinventing anything, but what we were, do, what we were doing is really trying to understand how you can develop uh, the enterprise services and, and, and uh, provision everything from our common desktop services and integrating our mission systems and then allowing people to come to the table with whatever device they had. So again, it was that not only BYOD, but it was also leaning more towards bring your own cloud, bring your own device, because frankly today most devices, you know, the smart devices that you buy, they they have a virtually what they call cloud in the box, you know, so your, your smart device is actually come with services and they render and provide you access to your your own personal cloud. So when you go to work, you, you're bringing that with you. And you want to be able to exchange and use that capability, you know, the same way you would if you were at home working from home or if you had to move files here and there. So the, the ideal of that, and not getting into, you know, into discussions around, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're totally talking unclassed here. So. So no worries with that. But this was our approach to really look at uh, how you would go about layering uh, layering uh, uh, services and how, what that might look like. And the most important thing is here that we really uh, – started to understand very well and where I started getting to the, the interoperability of it all was that we, we really had a ton of applications, I mean literally hundreds and maybe thousands of applications throughout our environment that frankly weren't built, you know, that were built maybe in the 90s, 80s, 90s, and frankly were not interoperable. They, you, you couldn't share the serve information between them without a lot of lifting. So we know you can build, you know, APIs. You can do that work, but it requires a lot of lifting. So next slide, please. So that's really where that was going. So uh, again, I, I was, we were rethinking how it, how would you go about delivering that kind of capability to an organization? And the first things first, you really have to start with governance and setting up what that is. And in this case, it was really SOA governance because SOA equals cloud, cloud equals SOA. If you if you don't 
I'll believe that ask anyone that has to deal with uh, delivery <laughs> and integrating these uh, uh, cloud service with their back-end services. So uh, this was really just our way of saying the goal is to establish a common foundation is used by engineers and architects when defining services and delivering services. So Ground Zero trying to to try to put our arms around what what is this really need for an organization that's trying to move into the 21st century. Um, next slide. Um, service learning the computer. Uh, what that really came down to from our governance perspective was uh, these were the principles, think intrinsic interoperability, think enterprise life cycle management, because it's not the one-time app application, it's, it's not the one-time API. It's really about the enterprise and how it's going to uh, interact and relate. Think security, banking top to bottom, uh, contract first, and when we say contract, that really is the service, uh, service agreements. And um, the interfaces between the entities are in those uh, things pattern centric. So if it works here, you, you've done it well, you've documented it well, hopefully you're at a CMMI level three minimally and you uh, can reproduce that uh, and reuse it. Uh, and think open standards. Uh, not that we are not, you know, we, we, we don't believe in the proprietary uh, 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 code and things that are the Developed that are really handy, if you will, and, and work very well. But the ideal is that if we could uh, work in an open standard community, we could, you know, certainly uh, be more agile in, in how we uh, implement and, and serve our customers. Next slide. So the need for boundaryless, boundaryless computing. Uh, the research really took us to this ideal behind bursting analytics. So uh, when you start to pull together all the, the hybrid uh, 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 activities and the hybrid services, uh, uh, community clouds and public clouds and all that and private clouds within your uh, area, within your domain or within your organization, what you really start to get into is wanting to, well, what you find is program managers want to start getting, you know, the, details, the real details out of that data. And so if you have services around, you know, your financial systems and you have services around uh, those HR systems and things, you certainly want to be able to get the analytics out of it. And, and so the bursting analytics uh, was really the ability to be able to uh, capture analytics from uh, these hybrid communities and, and, uh, and all the data. It goes into sort of the, the big data uh, uh, way of looking at things. And if I have lots of unstructured data as well as structured data, uh, there's, da there's details in there that I want to give, and so I need to focus on that. Internet of Things, hybrid communities, think government as a platform, uh, that's really uh, started to get into uh, some of the uh, uh, the actual smart link government uh, way of thinking, and this is sort of what I gleaned at least from my conversations with many of the colleagues around uh, AFIAC and smart link uh, about uh, the service integration models, about the life of this, and really being uh, customer or citizen centric. And so, if as we begin to think more citizen centric, not that we weren't, but I think it's it's truly uh, it's really it's coming realization now that the citizen is really driving what we do with the data and where the data goes. And so you need to think about building systems and services that are cross domain but they deliver platform service. And so this is really that era of uh, uh, citizen centric era, I think. Next slide. Um, Government as a platform, again, uh, just focusing on the transparent value of, of data and uh, relying on distributed computing, uh, inner ones, and reuse multiple times. So the ideal is, uh, and I don't think, I mean, I'm preaching to a fire here, finance, health, uh, transportation, uh, all those things that, uh, from a citizen standpoint, could be, you know, your, your personal data or even the government's data is in there, and it should be able to be easily distributed across any one of those domains or segments, if you will, or, or mission capabilities so that they can be used in, in ways without costing the, the public additional uh, additional monies to do that. Uh, 
we know, you know, as, as it goes, the one thing about solar that we know is that there is a huge upfront cost, but the return, the, uh, the return uh, is, is extremely uh, uh, valuable, and that's where you get the biggest benefit is the long term. So solar is really a long-term thinking approach, it's not the short-term. Uh, security drivers. Uh, again, um, this was uh, going back to that first slide, the leaders and where things are leading us and what's driving us, but also what's inhibiting us. Security and privacy is still, you know, some of those things that are happening. They're not happening in the future. They're happening now. They've been happening now for, I'd say, the last 20 years. Security has been a huge uh, driver of uh, how we should be thinking about and interacting our enterprise uh, data and, and systems and thinking about uh, our, uh, the assurance of our information. Um, so uh, I attended an information assurance forum or summit uh, late last year with NIST, and, and one of the topics that came out was this idea behind information insurance. So if you can't protect my data, then you, I want to insure it. And so, you know, whatever the, the cost might be uh, of me losing my Social Security and, and someone taking advantage of, of my personal data, knowing where I live, where I bank, uh, what grocery stores I go to, all these things, then maybe I want some insurance to, to cover some of, some of my risk. Uh, so that's, you know, that's a prevailing thought out there. Um, energy and telecommunication providers see the problem clearly. Uh, uh, one of the groups I work with at OMG is Security Fabric Alliance, and we talk about energy and telecommunications being Chinese twins. You can't have energy without telecommunications or broadband. You can't have broadband without energy. So they really, uh, you know, work hand in hand. And so one of the initiatives that we're working on is called the Threat and Risk Model Initiative. And what this is looking at is looking beyond cyber. It is really and truly looking at threats and risks uh, 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 agnostically that they're, they're coming from all segments, uh, uh, all domains, all sectors, and we, we need to be able to look at them and understand the impacts from one domain to the next. So certainly natural disasters impact our broadband, our broadband, uh, uh, you know, goes down and certainly impacts our finances. I mean, all these various impacts and uh, risk is how we're looking at it, and there's work that is happening there. Uh, and actually, we just uh, completed the first RFP. It was approved at OMG in, in June in Boston, and we're, we officially have formed our submitters team. So uh, uh, I am the government lead on that side, and we're working towards a, a model. We're working with Energy, FCC, a number of other agencies, but we're welcoming more agencies to get involved. Uh, the next uh, uh, conference is in Austin, and then the one after that in December is in Long Beach. So I just wanted to, to, to mention that because I think that's something that uh, from a, a planning and architecture perspective uh, you should be aware of and we should be sort of looking at what that means from a modeling perspective and integrating that, looking at how that could and will impact uh, this activity you know, security architecture reference model. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the tale of Catch-22. This is all, you know, APIs are king, build, uh, build them faster, build them interoperable, build them cheaper, but build them portable. They're just kind of, you know, opposite ends of the spectrum, build them open, but build them secure. And this came out of research from Forrester that it is truly a tale of catch 22 when it comes to APIs. So everything around services, all things around integration and data uh, uh, drives us to the API. Uh, and uh, means being one of the, 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 the models or the approaches for delivering data and sharing data across uh, segments and cross domains, uh, but at the end of the day, it comes down to the API and the endpoint and how that's going to work. And so the ideal here was really to just uh, be thinking about those things around uh, what, it, what it takes to build them. Next slide. Uh, 
Uh, I think this may be close to my last slide, but I wasn't bashing BlackBerry because I certainly know that BlackBerry has been, you know, around for quite some time and done fabulous things for the government, and without it, we wouldn't be where we are today, right? I mean, think about when we were just 15 years, 10 years ago, uh, without most devices, it was almost impossible to really do the things we're doing now. So anyway. Um, so where's your enterprise data going? Um, and uh, what's your strategy for mobile platforms? Uh, this is what I was driving at the NIST conference outside of the interoperability uh, discussion. It was really uh, hoping that I would strike some uh, uh, thoughts and uh, ideas and imagination around where, you know, where your data is going and really thinking strategically about it. So I attended the MIT conference that was really focused on uh, this idea of the chief data officer. And the chief data officer, you know, uh, is, is really a, a, a necessary, if you will, a necessary um, uh, role in the organization, and, and the way it was described at MIT was that uh, this this role is uh, you know is strategically focused on data. Uh, it sort of uh, uh, is akin to a CIO, but the CIO for for whatever reason uh, the growth maturity of our um, of our industry. Uh, the CIO is now more focused on operations. That's just the way it is uh, in a lot of ways. And and who is strategically, who's focusing strategically on the data? Um, it could be the enterprise architect. It could be the CTO. It's probably someone in finance who cares about where, you know. It's all those things, but you really do need to have a role, a button or a belly button, as they say, that you can put your finger on of someone that's really thinking about the data in an enterprise way and where it's going and how it's being secured. And, and, and you know, you could consider, you know, a privacy officer plays a role there, but they fall more on the legal side. So it's 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 a, it's a, it's a necessary role. So I believe that, you know, the next, I say, you know, five years or so, we'll see more and more and more of that role playing more of a strategic role with the assistant secretaries, uh, the top leaders of the organization, because it's really a key, uh, I think, a key uh, requirement for the federal government, you know, especially with the Data Act. And uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Finance always goes first, right? So financial reporting. Big thing in government now, exposing being transparent with your data. But as we talk about, you know, being more citizen centric with your data, uh, how do you how do you propose to do that? The data architect certainly isn't going to be that person, you know. That so so you come up a couple of levels and you say, well, the CIO, well, kind of, sort of, maybe, and uh, not necessarily. So someone has to be strategically focused on where that data is going and how it's being protected, and you need someone to, to focus on it. So anyway, that's what that slide is really about. Um, project interoperability. Uh, I just wanted to. Uh, touch bases here uh, where we are uh, with project interoperability. Uh, interoperability is an inhibitor to delivering enterprise services. So again, back to that data component and enterprise thinking. Next slide. Maybe there's a few more. This is just really to get to, to sort of whet your appetite for project interoperability. So we stood up the I2F uh, back in March. Uh, we at least did our version 0.5. <laughs> uh, and the reason why we did that uh, was because we posted it out on GitHub, and we're expecting for the community to really uh, collaborate with us and really uh, help to improve the content of that. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just wanted to get the one. Yeah, we have it, and you'll get. Oh, oh, oh okay. I'm sorry. No, 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 no worries. No worries. So, are we good on time? I just was. Okay. Okay. So the next, so this was. I think most of you are really are probably familiar with the I2F itself, and this is just a re recap. And uh, so far, so good. The feedback has been that this, you know, makes sense. It's starting to really get some traction. People are starting to really put their heads around. 
Um, so a, a, if you think of it in, in, in the most basic IT, you know, implementation uh, sort of principles, business, technology, and implementation, right? So this is really how you see by 2 us. So at the business layer, we really focus on those operational capabilities. We pull out the requirements for interoperability and in services. At the middle tier, we focus on the technical standards and technical capabilities that can that will help us achieve that, outlining those exchange patterns. And then at the bottom layer, we focus on the exchange specifications and the configuration of those technical standards and capabilities to deliver uh, uh, the uh, 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 interoperable services. Next slide. Uh, you can build that out for me. There's three tiers to this. So the I2F is really built upon these three tiers, architecture, standards and specifications, and a common profile. Next slide, please. And here's what that looks like in an integrated landscape. So this is where we really start to, 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 in some ways, teach how to use the I2F. The I2F itself is a guiding document, and so that's in the, the first uh, uh, peer there. It's, it's, it's a guide, and it provides the business, it allows us to look at the business and operational capabilities, the technical capabilities, and again, the exchange specifications, which you just saw in the previous slide. Now, how do we do that? Well. To articulate that, we do that in architecture. So this isn't, you know, rocket science here. It's, you know, tried and tested. Um, so we look at both business performance and security architecture at that layer. At the technical layer, we're looking at the application services and security. Again, security. So at every layer, there's security, uh, architecture requirements and components. At the last tier, uh, from the articulation perspective, we're looking at the infrastructure, the data, so that's where your need, your tagging, all those, your policies and those things come in uh, uh, around security and governance. So uh, from an architecture perspective, how we align the I2F to the architectures through that. And what we've done is we've built an architecture grid that will allow you to develop the artifacts based on those requirements for each one of those reference models. Uh, and the normalization piece of this is really identifying what industry standards industry standards are applicable. And the last but not least is the profiles where you actually populate that information into a standardized profile that goes beyond a technical profile. In most cases, architects and engineers are only familiar with that middle tier, which is the technical view, which gives you the technical standards, tells you what applications and services and those artifacts uh, that are aligned to that. What we're saying with the I2F, it's necessary to have that business view and it's necessary to even have an implementation instance of what that those technical capabilities represent. So we're calling it a fully distinguished profile as opposed to just a technical profile. Next slide, please. And these are the standards. And uh, where I came into the sort of the uh, the movie, if you will, with uh, Act I Act, and we start talking about the uh, the integrated services and the life events, and how any one of these patterns can represent a life event. Whether you're talking alert or broadcast uh, about your 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 uh, your need to you know, get your, you know, your, your health, your, your dental checkup, or, or whether you need, you're getting, uh, you're doing a workflow in terms of uh, uh, processing for your marriage license. I mean, all those things represent patterns. We can define patterns, whether they're workflows, choreography, and coordination, or a simple query and response. I want to know something, I get something back. Very simple, but in terms of, of working with other organizations, this is one of the major staples of the I2F is really to build common terms and common way of, 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 of speaking and communicating about, and communicating about these, uh, these services and how we actually can perform information exchanges. Next slide, please. Um, you can build this out. This is the sustainability slide. I've done this a couple of times with Act. It's just uh, speaking to 
uh, speaking to the uh, sustainability and, and how we get there. So it's about discovering services, building uh, interoperable services, and then being able to extend those services to other devices. And so that's, that's the sustainability model and, and module smart, smart development using, again, the solar principles. The flat, yeah, data portability challenge. I have nothing really much to say here. I said most of it. API is key. Uh, most important here is portability is a byproduct of interoperability. Next slide, please. Mobile IQ uh, and cloud IQ. So from an integration and a service perspective, what is your mobile IQ? Uh, we're challenging organizations to think about that. Again, it comes back to educating the federal government and ensuring that people kind of understand their application environment. Because they really don't. And I've worked at least seven organizations, and I'm always surprised. Uh, the Department of uh, Interior is a phenomenal organization, one of the best uh, that I worked for in terms of, of, of maturity of their processes. Highly, uh, I would say overall in most cases, a level three, level four CMMI in most cases for their business system. Is they're, they're pretty, uh, they got their stuff together. Um, so I work for financial business management system over there, so it's integration of, of both their um, acquisitions, their financial, their fleet management, you know, all those things. And, and I think the reason why that's important is because those cross in their entire organization, so everything was touched, uh, and they were able to do it. Uh, cost a lot of money, you know, that's the, you know, but, now they're at a place where they can actually extend those services to other applications, and that's the, that's the goal. Next slide, please. Uh, this is Project Interoperability. Just wanted to show you what it looks like at GitHub. Uh, and so we actually have the I2F. It's, it's there. You can actually get to it. Uh, you click on it, it loads a PDF. It's a 100-page document, lots of references. We have just one or two uh, use cases, but lots of uh, uh, information and reference material templates for your reference models, for the exchange patterns, how you use it, those kind of things. Next slide. And this is just showing you how the tools were kind of broken up in the, in the uh, uh, we kind of pulled them out, so you don't want to Slide two up. You just want to look at the architecture grid. Well, here you go. You just want to look at the common profile and see what it looks like. Here you go. So that's why uh, it was uh, uh, isolated. I'm sorry, segmented in that way. Some of the feedback we got from the community was that it was a lot. Well, you know, interoperable complex, right? And building interoperable services is not easy across a vast and very different, <laughs> you know, um, organization like the federal government, so you, you kind of have to approach it that way. Uh, and we have a few use cases, and there's more coming, working with uh, NINEO, uh, the Maritime Domain Awareness folks, to build a common uh, fully distinguished profile for their uh, domain, uh, Maritime Domain Architecture. So uh, some of that work is happening now. Uh, other activities around uh, uh, Sound. There's so many data aggregation, data tagging, lots of projects, uh, IDEA, um, that we're hoping to build use cases for using the uh, tools of the IT lab and sort of teaching and showing how it actually works. So I think that is it. <laughs> you can go to the site. This, these are just, no, these are just uh, the actual um, backup slides to kind of uh, show you how you use the grid. So uh, that's pretty much it. So I'll take uh, any questions or if there's any thoughts. Uh, and all those are linked uh, to uh, any of the, uh, I see right there, <laughs> uh, linked to uh, the documents and to the project interoperability itself. So. Yeah, personal question, burning yeah, question. Yeah, personal. Uh, personal chance over the information on the uh, So on both sides you have first, my background is okay. uh, paper browsing. Mm -hmm. uh, on your slide you have first analytics. A problem, something mm -hmm. that gets you. 
So uh, I've been doing this for about 20 years. About 15 or so years ago, there was a concept of a virtual data warehouse. The idea is you do not have to integrate all your data into one place. You can have query tools that will go out and query all your systems, kind of with Zillow looks like a little bit, without having all the, the contracts and services. That didn't go well. Okay. Uh, primarily because what organizations wanted to do is instead of querying an analytical query, I'm talking structured data, I'm yes. not sure. okay. uh, instead of querying, um, they didn't want to build a data warehouse, they wanted to query the financial system. The challenge with that is always that type of query that you do for analytics a lot different than the type of query that you would do for transactions. Transactional is a very quick in and out, give me a record, what's the sale for mm -hmm. Analytical would be a uh, decision support system, it's a different query, give me month in balance, really in balance for all accounts for like 30 years. Mm -hmm. That's a different query. Systems, the, the base systems are designed differently. One is designed for transactional, quick in and out, OLTP, uh, decision support time, starts getting whatever. It's designed another way to handle that. So, Anytime you hear this, this came up in the data act as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Christina hope that we're not going to build a data world. So the thought is they're not going to build a data warehouse. We're going to insert and export out. Mm -hmm. My thinking is how are we going to do in, in this architecture? How would we do analytics? Because if you send an analytical query to one of these systems, like a system designed for transactional, it's not going to work. We're going to bog the system down and we'll bog the kill the query and we won't get our data back. Can you yeah, absolutely. I haven't actually built a bursting analytics system, but the idea behind the bursting analytics is really that, you know, sort of if you, if you can envision, you know, clouds that are, you know, heavy and, and ready to break, right? So the ideal is that you have the, uh, the uh, data mark, you have uh, lots of structured data, you have data bursting at the scene. No pun intended there, but you literally do. And a lot of that data is being transposed to school of uh, your organization. And the ideal is being able to tag that data in such a way that when I, to your point, do a request or, or a query, that when I get back or I have predetermined reports, that it's, uh, they're automatically built. So, so the ideal is that these things are sort of built sort of organically. And, and it's not it's not it's not that you're you're particularly going out and you're uh, doing this hardcore uh, development. There's tools out there that will capture that information based on the data, based on your pre-described uh, needs and and requirements, and then build those reports. And so, you what we're saying is that as you cross. That as you cross boundaries of both public data, which might be, you know, could be your, uh, I don't know, let's say you have high value data set of, uh, say, uh, 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 or in, in, in NSA, we were doing, you know, we have the non proliferation data, right? So you might have some data around treaties, or, and some of that is private, right? But I mean, there are there are data, there are a high value data. That they deal with that. Then you have high value data sets that also might deal with, you know, the number of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, nuclear devices we have. You might have data sets that, that talk about the number of sites. You might have data sets that talk about. So you have all this interaction of both uh, private and public data, and then the ideal is that you would be able to, and then you have sensor data, and this is really coming from that geospatial uh, uh, ideal. So you had, um, when we were working with the, the geo folks, um, their, their biggest concern was that they couldn't, they couldn't even deal with all the data. So visually, they had data bursting. Uh, at the scene in terms of their uh, being able to manage it and where is it, you know, how they're hosting it and where they're going. So the ideal is that you would have uh, this capability that would allow you, based upon the, the, the smart tags, based upon requirements, based upon reporting needs, that you would actually add data within flight. You know, not everybody has data within flight. You could actually build uh, immediately uh, build that data. And because maybe it's hosted somewhere 
uh, off site and you not building the warehouse. So not that, you know, I'm not pooing warehouses, but you know, that's certainly technology that had its day. But the ideal is that you don't need a warehouse because the data is in transit constantly and unless in, in, in those cases where you actually require a data out, you know, you use it for that purpose that's really uh, uh, not really near time. It's not even close to, you know, exact data. So, so you, the data warehouse doesn't really play a role here. So you're, you're only talking about capturing data. Why? And not necessarily querying it. The, no, exactly. The contracts are already... So the issue with what the scenario I described is ad hoc analysis. Mm -hmm. Some user exactly. doesn't go crazy and kill the system. So what you're saying is the data is flying, it's packed, so you're just plucking it out of the air. You are. And okay. transactions, and especially for, again, you look at geospatial, you know, that data is constant. It's a constant stream. So how are you going to um, determine the, 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 the smart, the, the information and intelligence from that data. Uh, you're not going to wait till it goes to the data warehouse. If you want that data as soon as it is being derived or developed and, and you want to point in time. So if it is kind of that point in time, it's like, boom, you know, this is, this is what's going on here. You can get a trend on that, but you can get real you can analysis. Do it real you can do real-time analysis. It's a trend you have to store it. Right. Right. So you know, real-time analysis. So that was the sort of key term there. At least that's the research that I see. I haven't actually, again, built a bursting analytics system, but I've heard a lot, and the need is really in the intelligence community right now, especially, and I would imagine in finance as well, but the intelligence community, uh, specifically around geospatial, that is when you get near real time, yeah. you can't. You can take your house and you can load it on the system. You really need versus high capability and uh, being able to derive that from all the multiple streams. You know, so uh, so that was. Thank you. Any other questions? What? Uh, uh, just a comment. This is Rick Smith uh, on the phone. Emily did a very nice job as usual. Can you hear me? Thank you, Rick. Yes, Rick, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to give uh, an update. Uh, sorry, actually, I'm sorry I'm not there, but we're driving my son up to fly to uh, NYU Shanghai so we can start getting uh, data updates from China. But the, uh, one of the things that uh, Pamela and I uh, have been trying also to do is to start uh, getting some of the existing agencies like DHS and uh, VA and some of the ones to uh, start participating in trying to exercise some of the principles she talked about today uh, in their uh, uh, in, in their build-ups. And uh, you know, we, she and I have been uh, running around with I2F under our, our handbag for about nine months. Right now, I just want to say that she and I are in the process of beginning a, a uh, DHS which hopefully will be uh, two NEEM areas, uh, the emergency management NEEM area, which is built out, and the uh, chemical, biological, radiational, nuclear, I think it goes, right? And try okay. to integrate those and see how uh, this thing puts together and uh, you know, at a high level so that uh, it can start to build out. Uh, in addition, I've been uh, had the opportunity to talk to Rick Holgate, our new uh, ACT, year, uh, and his suggestion was that we look at the 1VA, the SSA, and maybe uh, one of the things that they are looking at. So I just, for the PA group there, I just want to say that we're in the process of trying to see uh, if we can't uh, get some volunteers and start up some workshops in trying to execute some of the stuff that uh, Pamela was talking about this morning. Thank, thank you. Yeah. This is Dr. Ramsey on the phone as well. I'm sorry I couldn't be there. I've got a couple of things I'm getting done here at Central Office, but I'm from the VA, so I'm actually, uh, it was good to hear a lot of the stuff that Pamela was talking about. Well, hopefully it's going to be a great advantage for you. So, so we'll be, I would be happy to come over there and, and, and have a chat with anyone over there at VA and talk about, you know, the, the kinds of things that um, 
uh, we, we shared today. Uh, so, you know, my information is on the slides. Uh, just hit me with an email. It could be something as simple as a quick phone call, and then we can follow up with additional discussion. So, uh, you just let me know. Hey, well, you, you talked earlier about the, uh, the, the UMG Threat and Risk Model Initiative. Uh, can you elaborate about that a little bit? Sure. That, and that initiative started, I want to say, uh, November 2013 uh, is when it started, maybe a little sooner. Yeah, maybe a little sooner than that. But uh, initially it started off uh, as a uh, cyber risk and threat model. And very quickly after the team got together, we have folks from both industry, finance, uh, and modelers, and architects, and, you know, you know, vendors that are coming from all these various sectors. And after we sat down um, for, you know, several discussions, it was clear that it wasn't just the cyber component of it all, and that cyber is only one component of risk and threat, threat and risk. And frankly, organizations are trying to get their arms around, um, if I have a uh, threat here, what risk does that pose to other parts of our organization? And so using the, the, the uh, Energy and broadband sector is one example of, you know, if there's a natural disaster that takes down, you know, broadband, that's certainly going to affect energy. Uh, likewise, energy goes down, broadband is no longer uh, viable or available in, in, in a lot of cases. And we've experienced that right here, right? I mean, earthquake, in, in miles <laughs> or whatever. Um, uh, you know, I don't know where the fire or something, but um, we experienced that cell phones went out, things like that. That's because some reactor or something could hit or something happened. So, I mean, you know, this, this is what happens. And so it was really clear that we need to take a what we consider a more broader uh, look at risk and threat. And, and I don't think it's you know, with the rocket science, because frankly, in, in, in business, that's how they look at risk. They look at it from a broad perspective. But now you bring in cyber, well, where does that fit? And then you bring in natural disasters, where does that fit? And then you bring in law enforcement and counterterrorism, where does that fit? So it was the ideal that risk, there could be a threat from anywhere. And uh, what we need to do is come up with a common vocabulary for those where? About 10 years ago, we, uh, before we, before cyber security, we were talking information assurance and addressing yes. people's well. And people's yes. well um, address not only IT security, but also hurricanes, tornadoes, inside yes. threats, outside threats. And um, so it sounds like we're coming back in a circle to where we realize that the net of cyber, focusing on solely cyber, is too narrow of a, of a net, and we need to Absolutely. be more of a holistic approach to integrating all threats. Uh, so a lot of things we're talking about was done, or at least attempted to, to be done, uh, several years ago. In fact, I worked in the Department of Interior on some of the things they had going back in 1998 and 2000. Uh, the bill uh, in the affairs. Um, so the things you're saying, I say, I applaud you for that because it's, it's, it's um, more, there's more risk, uh, risk uh, and dangers than just cyber. And uh, and, the, and the weak link in cyber security is physical security. If you don't look at physical security, you think all I do is put uh, sensors in my network or firewalls, and I'm protected and put my data, I'm safe. Well. You're very naive. Yes, yes, I, I completely agree. And so, so what we, what we, what happened is that as we were looking at these various segments of security, information security, and risk and threats, uh, the idea was that there was so many different protocols to exchange the data. You have mean, you have XML, you have uh, 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 EDXL. You, you know, you had like a plethora, sidebox. Of, of protocols 
and exchange, um, you know, sort of protocols where they were trying to exchange the data, but they couldn't talk to each other. So that even took us further. Um, uh, it, it sort of explained that, you know what, we're really looking at situational awareness, and we're really looking at how you build a conceptual model initially, right, that would allow uh, us to exchange data no matter what segment it was coming from and no matter what protocol. And in order to do that, you have to have a common vocabulary. So it, it was really the basic, the things that we already know, but somehow they've escaped us because we got caught up on the buzzword. They got caught up on the exchange model, you know, mean versus fixed versus EDXL and emergency management versus XML. So we we want to get out of that. Now, we understand there's a need for a business platform model. That could be need, but we're saying that it doesn't have to be need. Um, that could, you know, pull up all of those things into a business uh, sort of uh, exchange, if you will. But, um, but yeah, so, so it really did... Uh, I think to your point, it came full circle. I think more importantly that the standard uh, that we're looking at uh, will cross government, private, you know, and can be built into a tool. So that's, you know, that's the, the challenge and that's the goal, to have a standard that you could use to be able to exchange information across those uh, different sectors of, of government or industry. In, in the threat and risk model initiative, do you think that a common vocabulary or glossary or ontology as such would, would be the intended uh, outcome? Uh, it certainly will be a, a large part of it. I mean, so so we probably won't uh, get everything done uh, within the time frame because OMG has a very different model than, say, ISO and, and IEEE. If we really, you know, it's an 18-month turnaround. Uh, could be three years, but rarely is it. So, so our focus right now is building. Uh, we've been building those conceptual models for uh, the financial and for uh, and for cyber, and then also I think we get narrowed down to three or four areas. But we have experts in each one of those areas, so we think we can probably get it done uh, or close to being done. So. So that is uh, the submission is in January 2015. Um, team is formed. So we, we are looking for people that are interested in being um, contributors. So this is, this is all related to the financial data yeah. The financial is related just to risk? Just uh, yeah. Risk, yeah. Situational awareness. And the financial community is very interested in it. Uh, we have people uh, from um, a number of large financial institutions that. Uh, I should probably cross pollinate with So it is that plays to our whole interoperability discussion as well, because it is about being able to share information from, say, a cyber threat to, uh, you know, someone that's interested in that threat for whatever purposes they, they need to understand because of their financial system or maybe because of their embedded control system or maybe because, you know, they're concerned that they won't get this patch by the time, you know, hurricane, you know, Harry comes, you know, whatever, situational awareness is key because then you can understand um, what your, you know, what your risks are. So? Uh, I, I have a question. Uh, Pam, are you, are you working at all with anybody in DOD on uh, with what I've heard something referred to as the, as the DOD data framework or has it taken on a yeah. twist? The, the DoD data framework. Uh, I've heard different different sorts. In some respects, I, I sort of wonder if it uh, isn't really taking on a, a flavor more like the project interoperability efforts. Uh, I'm not familiar with their. I, I, I've heard a couple of things over there of um, this uh, ideal to sort of not. I guess to repurpose uh, DoDAP into 
a unified modeling, a unified framework, architecture, architecture framework. Then I also know that there is a UMF. Uh, initiatives, but that's more of an international unified messaging framework. I haven't heard of a unified data framework, so uh, I'm familiar with those two. Yeah, it's not, not so much the unified data framework. I know I've seen the term DOD data framework turned around, and depending on who you talk to, you hear different different answers of what it's about. I can certainly, I certainly want to look into that because it'd be very interesting to see what they're doing other than, I do know that DOD has recently um, been, um, I guess, I don't want to say commanded, but instructed to use me as their, <laughs> as their, you know, model. That's what you're sitting here. <laughs> instructed, <laughs> ask nicely, I'm, yeah, I'm, you know. <laughs> I, I would think if you, if you, I would think you're probably getting a lot of, uh, I would think you're probably getting a, a, an interested audience from the intel community, if anybody, with respect to what you're talking about here. Well, yeah, I mean, they're really interested in the profile of it all, uh, but you know, the one of the things you'll see in the I2F is we, we did also align the PAG, which is their uh, <laughs> You know, non-public architecture, public architecture framework. There may be other things going on there, but um, so so we did align to that as well. We aligned that one. We did DoDap, TOGAP, PAG, uh, Beast. Oh, I think at least five uh, typically use architecture framework, yep. and we aligned them all. And then we asked the interoperability questions uh, from data, business, application. Security framework perspective, and then you can crosswalk them depending on whatever framework you're in. So we ask the question: You're in DoDap, okay, but you you want to talk to someone that's using DoDap? Here's the artifacts you use. Here's the ones that they use. Or here's the alignment to their framework. So, all right, so you so you, in, in the alignment, if you could talk about a little bit of, about what you've done in terms of aligning the different frameworks, that would be interesting. Have you, have you, yeah, actually, can you go back and apply it? I'll show you right here, right there. So, for example, okay, um, yeah, that's the that's uh, a section of the grid that we developed. Um, so this is uh, we're focusing on the data domain. So what we did is we we instead of using uh, GoDAF or TOGAF or any of the other ones, we, we, we just said, you know, commonly used, most instances, everyone has a data domain for their architecture. They, in most instances, there's a business architecture. In most instances, there's an application, you know, so forth and so on. So we, we, we focused on the, the very, uh, uh, the, the basic common uh, denominator, which are the domains, and then from that domain, we had particular areas of interoperability that we were concerned with, and asking those particular questions, we then described what the artifact should look like, and then we aligned the common approach, DODAF or UAF, uh, the GERA, or the, you know, uh, GRA. Who's behind the GRA? That's a global. Global, global uh, reference are there? Yeah, global reference are And this is the sponsor? It's a geospatial. Geospatial. Okay. And then uh, I see with PAG and then TOGAF. So the one that was the most, you know, where I was at DOE, we used TOGAF, but some folks used TOGAF. But I like TOGAF because to me it was clearer, it was easily understood. I didn't have to spend a lot of time on it. That's just my personal opinion. Um, you want to solve problems, you want to give people answers quickly. It was it, it was an easier uh, fit for us. But you know, um, uh, DODAP was very well documented. So we said, you know, there's Frankly, the, the, even the OMB is looking at DODAP and merging both DODAP and Beast in some ways because the common approach does take some of the artifacts from DODAP and align them to uh, the common approach. So if you're familiar with the common approach, we use that, and then we went to DODAP and the others. 
to sort of align them, asking the questions around um, uh, the requirements for interoperability. So, so, and we do, and there's going to be a revision because on the token side, we do have the artifacts, but they're not linked. And uh, they're not under the uh, website. And so, we're, yeah, so we own them. I know my organization owns the actual artifacts for them, but uh, they're not out there uh, in public view. So we're trying, we're trying to work with them. <coughs> Togat or the, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the organization. The Open Group. Open Group. And we're working with the Open Group to see if they can um, put them out, you know, publicly. A lot of sense, um, even if you're not a member. <laughs> if you, you know, this is how you get uh, buy-in. Just a little bit. Are there any other questions? No question, Mr. Shelton, again, I'm very quick down, but very impressed with your presentation and the and the uh, conversation and dialogue after. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Shelton. I appreciate it. Yeah, Pamela, let me say that for the, uh, for, for the project we've been working on, the, the Smart Thing Government, I view you as the main champion, of course. So um, it's, it's always good to have you on board, really. So, yeah, it's been fun. Like a wave of magic wand, I'd set up a road show, and you know, you'd be the, uh, <laughs> you'd be the lead act. <laughs> or maybe the anchor act, right? because you'd be a hard act to follow. <laughs> yeah, it's been fun. A lot of this is, I think, you know, uh, collective thinking and just putting it to bringing it together. You know, it's not one person. It's really... Uh, Discipline, the experience. Yeah. Okay. Well, that that uh, that concludes our, our meeting for today. Pamela, well, thank you thank so, you. so very, very much for the time you took to prepare this. Excellent material. It's always good. And uh, the slides are are the slides available to post them? You can post them. Yes, those have been pre-posted. So. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thanks everyone for coming.